I'm going to talk about uh, the problem of counting communities. So you have, um, you have heard a lot about this problem of plenty of clicks, plenty of com communities in random graphs, and you can consider problems of detecting uh, detection, which is uh, you know testing whether or not there is a plenty of community, or recovery, which is recovering the members of this plenty of community. And I'm going to talk about a slightly different problem today, which is counting the number of communities, which we're actually going to pose as a testing problem. <laughs> You'll see. Oh, oh, uh, this uh, work is uh, uh, joint work with my great collaborators, uh, Cindy Raj from Columbia, uh, Fiona Skirman from Uppsala, and uh, Alex Wang from uh, UC Davis. And uh, we're also very thankful to uh, Guy Bressler for the useful discussions that we had at Simon's Institute. Okay, so you have seen this picture lasts throughout the workshop, but I'm just going to do a quick recap. This is the planted click model. So suppose there is a size k click. So it's a subset of uh, the vertices one, two, three, up to n. And for pairs of vertices that are both inside of the click, with probability one, there's an edge between them. So there is a size k click planted inside of this random graph. And all the edges, they're formed randomly, independently, uh, with probability a half. So given this model, say we want to recover the members of uh, uh, the, K, uh, the, the size K subset, then this is the sort of phase diagram um, for like the statistical computational uh, landscape. So the statistical threshold happens around k that scales as a constant factor of log n. So when k is smaller than 2 log n, basically there is uh, um, no way of uh, recovery because uh, basically by random chance, there is uh, going to be, well, with high probability, there's going to be another click of size k popping up just randomly from the Erdo, uh, background Erdo Schrödinger graph, and there's no way of uh, uh, telling like that from the true plenty of click, which is the true click. And uh, when k is larger than a constant multiple of uh, log n, you can basically run exhaustive search um, across all size k subsets to find this click. And the computational threshold is uh, sitting at a place that is exponentially larger than the statistical threshold. So you need a lot stronger signal strength if you're only given a limited polynomial time computational power. So when k is um, larger than actually a constant multiple of square root n, in this case, you can use a simple degree counting algorithm to recover the members of the click. Actually, um, a degree counting algorithm, um, so it means you basically look at the degrees of all the vertices and just uh, arrange them um, in order of their magnitude. So this is actually going to give you only a constant fraction of uh, vertices that are uh, when you're very close to this uh, computational threshold. But for problems, uh, for click recovery problems like this, you can actually do a very easy cleanup step where once you find a constant fraction of members of uh, the click, then you can look at the rest of the graph and look at everything that is uh, connected to all these guys that you know are for sure in the click. And then if you only have partial recovery, you can always do a simple cleanup to get to exact recovery. Okay. And when k is uh, much smaller compared to root n, possibly up to polylogarithmic factors, it's conjectured that there are no polynomial time algorithms that contain the um, that can achieve a recovery consistently. Okay. So aside from the recovery problem, we also talk about the detection problem, which is uh, testing whether or not there is a planted click. So that is testing this planted click distribution against this in an Erdos-Schrödinger graph, where the edge probabilities are IID Bernoulli a half. And uh, we want to find some test that achieves uh, basically type one plus type two error be um, all vanishing to zero as the size of the graph grows to infinity. Okay? And um, 
um, again, we have the recovery task, and usually, you, uh, you know, as I was saying, you have these uh, different types of recovery, like you have partial recovery, or you have recovering almost all the vertices, or you recover all the vertices exactly. And here, all the thresholds for all different types of recovery actually sit at the same place, which is k-scaling like uh, square root 10. And for the planted click problem, as we know, the computational threshold for detection and recovery, they actually coincide at this root 10 level, but that in general is not the case. So in fact, if we move to a um, simple variant of the planted click model to the planted, this is called the planted dense subgraph model, then we actually already see a drastic change in the landscape. So um, suppose you still have a subset K uniformly chosen, um, and the edge probabilities, instead of um, the edges in the click being just a Bernoulli one, here we have it uh, following in Bernoulli P distribution, and for the now edges, they follow Bernoulli Q distribution, where P is uh, some number that is larger than Q. So this problem has a somewhat uh, complicated but very elegant phase diagram. So this is a picture that I directly took from uh, um, Guy and the Matthew Brennan's paper, where these are the sharp thresholds for the detection problem and the recovery problem. Oh, oh it's working. So the community detection problem um, its phase diagram basically is divided into the three parts. Right? You have the information theoretically impossible regime, so there is no estimator even if you're given infinite computational resources, and there is a polynomial time, uh, uh, there is a poly time easy regime where um, a degree counting test is going to succeed. And uh, there is a, a hard regime where it's conjectured to be hard, um, to uh, conjecture to be impossible to get a computation, a polynomial time algorithm when we're in this regime. So the regime is parametrized with the, the two parameters where the signal strength is parametrized with p minus q squared divided by q times one minus q, and it's assumed to scale like n to the minus alpha. So as alpha increases, um, your signal strength actually decreases. So as alpha grows the problem, both recovery and uh, detection, they become harder and harder. And there is another parameter, beta, or uh, which is parametrizing the size of the click. And as beta grows, the problem should get easier and easier. So this is the phase diagram. The phase diagram for recovery is a, a little bit more complicated. So there is, a, again, an impossible regime. And here you can already see that the impossible regime does not exactly align with um, the impossible regime for the detection problem. There's also an easy regime um, for recovery by degree counting. And there is a regime here that is conjectured to be computationally hard. So you see there is a red triangle here that is uh, labeled uh, an open regime in the paper. Um, but actually, um, in uh, a later paper by uh, um, Alex and uh, Slil, uh, they're able to actually get uh, harness against our low degree polynomial algorithms. Um, but I think there may be some intrinsic difficulty of um, getting harness of uh, such recovery results um, via uh, techniques by like sort of re reducing to known conjectures such as planted click. But uh, so we'll touch on that later, maybe, in the talk. Okay. So we're going to focus on a simpler special case and just to look at the conjecture, the computational thresholds in these special cases. So suppose um, the within 
community edge connection probability is uh, simply 2Q, so twice the connection probability of uh, the null edges, then the, this is what the computational thresholds reduce to. So when Q is much larger compared to N squared over K to the fourth, we know that detection is computationally easy. But if you want to do recovery within polynomial time, then it seems the best uh, the least signal strength you are going to need is actually Q being larger than N over K squared, which is uh, a much stronger assumption or condition than the threshold for detection. So in other words, here, for the planted then subgraph problem, we already see there is this gap between detection and recovery. In other words, there exists a regime of parameters where you can easily detect, so you have an algorithm that can tell you with high probability there is or is not a click, but if you know there is a click, you cannot, in polynomial time, recover the members of this click, so recovery is hard. So now, with all that sort of uh, preface, <laughs> uh, we're going to move to what we're going to actually talk about in this talk, right? So the existence of this regime actually leads us to uh, think about, okay, a natural next step question is, in this sort of middle ground regime where you know detection is easy but recovery is hard, say, can you shoot for a lower hanging fruit? Say, you cannot recover all the members of the community, but can you, say, infer something about the planted community structure? Right. Can you um, tell a little bit about the hidden community without recovering all of them? So this is uh, how we're going to formulate it. We're going to consider, again, along the toy example, we're going to consider this uh, testing problem, or we're going to count a counting problem of uh, one planted community versus two planted communities. Right. So we say, well, in this regime where we know we cannot recover all the members here, but suppose there is an alternative distribution that considers two planted communities, both half the size of the one planted community, then can we, is there a regime where maybe this counting problem is easier than the recovery problem. So can we at least tell how many communities are inside of the planted dense subgraph? So here, oh, I, want to, um, I want to just make a comment that the choice of uh, 3Q here in this sort of toy example is just to balance out the uh, first moments. So if you look at the average degree for all the nodes, that are uh, within some community, um, you basically add this guy up across the row and you're going to see that under the now and alternative distribution, um, the first moments are going to match. So you cannot easily distinguish these two uh, distributions via just a simple degree count or an edge count. Okay. All right, so a natural test to consider is uh, a third moment test by just counting the number of triangles. And we're going to quickly go over just the first and second moment calculation here. So let M be the number of triangles, right? If you look at the difference in the expected value of uh, the number of triangles under the two distributions, you're going to see that a lot of cancellations happen. Basically for all the triangles where um, not all of the vertices are within some planted community. Um, all those uh, terms in the expected value, they are going to cancel. And we're only left with basically the uh, k cubed terms for the triangles where all its vertices are within some planted community. And the difference in the first moment is going to be like a constant multiple of q cubed k cubed. 
and you do the variance calculation, then the, you don't have the nice cancellations anymore, and the variance you get is going to scale like uh, n cubed q cubed for um, uh, under both the one planted and two planted community distributions. So you do a quick comparison between the first and second moment uh, using Chebyshev's uh, inequality, you get that by simply thresholding the number of triangles at the threshold where the variance, square root of the variance is much smaller compared to the difference in the mean, you can have a test that uh, consistently distinguishes between these two distributions exactly when Q is much larger compared to N over K square. Right. Now note that this is, yes. Uh, let me think. In the paper, we actually count signed triangles here, but I'm thinking in this toy example, can we get away with? Yeah, because I'm considering Q small, but. Uh, you know what, to be safe, let's say we're counting sine triangles. <laughs> I, I, okay. Yeah, so say we're counting sine triangles. Say we're actually looking at like the product of uh, the edge, say AIJ, then minus Q, then this uh, variance bound definitely works because uh, we actually needed to count the uh, sine triangles in the general case in order to get this bound, so. But in the toy example now, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but thank you. So, note that this threshold, Q being larger than N over K squared, actually exactly coincides with um, what is the threshold for recovery of um, um, the planted K community. So we know that in this regime, Q larger than K N over K squared, this triangle counting test, um, it succeeds in counting the number of communities. And we know that when Q is uh, larger than this threshold, then there is an algorithm that easily recovers the communities as well. And it's pretty easy to see that uh, the task of recovery is, well, it's naturally a much harder task, or it's at, le sorry, it's at least as hard as the task of counting the number of communities. Because say you have an algorithm that can successfully um, recover all the vertices inside of this community under the left distribution, then it's easy to go in there and check, okay, whether or not I'm getting a one community block or I'm getting two community blocks. So the task, um, so the other direction is uh, the more interesting direction that we want to consider though. So is the task of um, counting communities strictly easier than recovering communities, right? And this triangle test seemed to suggest that, oh, maybe you cannot do better than this threshold. And this is precisely what we established in this paper. So um, there are a few ways to sort of word uh, our result. So we can say that this triangle test is actually optimal among all low degree polynomial algorithms. So in other words, it actually attains the computational limit for this uh, testing problem between the one planted and two planted communities. Or in other words, we show that the computational limit for the community recovery problem actually coincides exactly with this uh, problem of testing one versus two communities. Or in other words, we're claiming that actually counting communities is just as hard as community recovery, which was sort of a counterintuitive res uh, result when we first saw it. And in fact, later uh, as we explore the general case, we're going to see that it's actually 
uh, inferring anything about the planted, uh, uh, like uh, the structure within the planted community is just as hard as recovery, uh, recovering all the members of the planted community. Okay, so this is our informal theorem under this uh, toy model parameterization. So we have if Q times K squared is larger than one, then this uh, sign, the triangle test, let's be safe, <laughs> succeeds in testing one versus two planted communities. And um, if um, Q K squared is much smaller than one, then up to some polylogarithmic factors, or when K is uh, much smaller than root 10, so that's um, uh, the regime where even under the planted click model, you cannot uh, uh, reliably test. So in this regime, we show that uh, there are no low degree tests that succeeds in testing between these two communities. Okay. So um, at least in the regime where K is much larger than root 10, our upper bounds and lower bounds, they do match up to polylogarithmic factors. So now I want to move to the uh, full model formulation that we consider. So in general, we consider this uh, binary observation model with potentially multiple planted communities. So we have uh, uh, the parameters uh, include number of vertices and the total number, the total number of vertices that are within some communities K there are some edge um, probability parameters Q and S, the number of communities little m, and finally we have a vector of community size proportions um, that sum to one. So in our result, we basically assume that this is uh, a vector of uh, constants and they don't need to be balanced. So you could have some planted communities that are slightly larger than some others. And we assume that the community labels are generated as follows. So for each vertex in the graph, their label is generated independently. And with the probability XL, so XL is uh, uh, from the community size proportion, XL times K over N, um, this, uh, this uh, vertex is going to belong to community L. So with probability uh, in total K over N, each vertex is going to belong to some community. And with probability one minus K over N, it's not going to belong in any of the communities. Okay. And now given the community assignments, the edges, they're generated independently from Bernoulli distributions, where um, the within community, um, uh, Bernoulli success probability, we, uh, we scale it like Q plus S over XL. So sort of the comparison between S and Q is uh, you can view this as our signal strength. And for all the null edges, they're simply following IID Bernoulli Q. And I want to just comment that uh, this scaling is to make sure that the first moment matchup so the average degree of each vertex that are is in some community, uh, you can work it out uh, uh, according to the model, and it's going to be equal to QN plus SK, which is something that does not depend on the number of communities M or the uh, how the uh, or the relative size of the communities, the vector X. So. Um, before I talk about our result, um, I want to mention just the two um, conditions that we use to characterize the strength of a test. So we say that, so these are sufficient uh, conditions for like uh, consistent testing. So if you have a test, uh, we say a test strongly separating t the two distributions, if um, there, the maximum of the variances under the two distributions, their square root is small compared to the uh, difference in expected value. So if you have this, then it's sufficient for you to deduce that um, there is a, a test, um, there is a test that achieves a vanishing type one plus type two error. Okay. 
And then we also consider a weekly, uh, a week uh, separation criteria, where instead of little O, you have big O here. So this is a weaker condition, but um, it says that you cannot, um, um, you cannot test um, with high probability, but you can test better than random guessing. So this is our main theorem. Okay, uh, there is some uh, notation to unpack, but uh, most of them are not too important. Uh, we are ass uh, assuming that basically the community sizes are sort of balanced, so they're all like uh, this, uh, the relative size of the communities, they are uh, all, uh, they're all sort of constant proportions of each other. Then we have that if d to the five times the um, maximum size of uh, two planted distributions with two number of communities m and m prime times uh, this blue guy here, s squared over q, k squared over m max with one, is um, little o of one, then there's no degree d test that can weakly separate p and q. And of course, uh, um, as a consequence, no such test can strongly separate p and q. And in the other direction, we show that um, um, the difference between the two distributions, uh, number of communities in the two distributions, m minus m prime, q, uh, some power two over three times basically the same thing um, in the regime where k is larger than root 10. When this guy is larger than one, then the tr assigned triangle counting test is going to succeed. So a bunch of the, these jargon on the sizes of n and m prime and k, they're not that important. Um, in the uh, in the more interesting regime where, say, you m and m prime are both constants, so if they don't grow to infinity, then these conditions, basically, they are going to vanish, they're going to be satisfied automatically. And uh, in the regime where k squared is larger than n, our upper and lower bounds are going to match up to polylogarithmic factors. And here, note that the dependence in the degree of the polynomial is actually polynomial. So we can allow this degree to, to grow polynomially uh, um, as a, sorry, po polylogarithmic in N. And our upper and lower bounds are still going to match up to a polylogarithmic factor. And uh, this is, uh, um, the test that we use for the general, uh, under the general model, where we count the number of signed triangles. So that is, we look at the uh, uh, zero one edges um, and then minus Q to sort of center the null edges at zero, and then look at uh, the sum of these signed triangles, and then look at the first and second moments. So taking the sine triangles instead of just the triangles, they really help us bound the second moments. And all that jargon that you saw earlier, the conditions on M and M prime, they're basically to, for making sure that um, um, the remainder terms in the variance calculations, they can be absorbed in the main term that is of order N cubed Q cubed. So this is the easy part. Um, oh, so actually, how much time do I have? <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so this, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the more important part is, of course, uh, the lower bound. And uh, for this part, well, Alex has uh, already sketched a blueprint in his talk on Wednesday. So uh, I'm going to do a quick recap. And uh, this blueprint was uh, uh, first used in um, the paper by uh, Alex M. Slill and uh, in showing harness of uh, estimation or recovery of the planted click. And uh, uh, it basically follows the following like uh, proof outline. So you first reduce the problem of uh, ruling out weak separation to the problem of bounding 
this sort of advantage quantity, which is uh, the chi-square divergence from the mm, distribution P to distribution Q plus one, which can be written as this ratio of uh, expected value of F under P divided by square root, uh, expected value of uh, F squared under Q over uh, taking maximum over all degree D, polyno degree D uh, polynomials F. And it suffices to bound this advantage by uh, one plus little one. And uh, it's a pretty standard easy proof. So I'm not going to go over this part. And usually, so the technical difficulty that we have here is uh, now both P and Q are going to be these uh, strange looking planted distributions. Right, so whether you take P to be um, the distribution with one planted community or um, Q as the one with a one planted community, there are going to be these uh, sort of mixture uh, distributions, which is going to make the calculation of uh, the second moment in the denominator sort of nasty. So as uh, Alex sketched in his talk on Wednesday, um, the way they sort of address this difficulty is uh, by taking two sets of um, basis functions for these polynomials where, okay, we're going to write the data A as the maximum of um, the signal which contains the random edges in the planted communities, maximum with uh, IID just ordo Schrani graph with success probability Q, okay? And we're going to define a set of basis functions that is only a function of these uh, nice looking IID random entries. And that's going to end up uh, basically simplifying the denominator calculation. And uh, I'm going to refer you to his talk for um, some more detailed calculations, but um, via some, um, uh, analysis in the Hilbert space, we can show that the advantage uh, is bounded by this guy, C transpose M inverse, where uh, uh, C is a vector and M is a matrix, and they're defined according to, you know, the distribution of uh, uh, the distribution P and Q and uh, the uh, moments of um, these basis functions under these two distributions. And uh, the nice thing is uh, M is actually a matrix uh, that is uh, whose inverse is somewhat tractable to compute. After some linear algebra, you can represent the bound as a summation of a bunch of R alpha square terms where R alpha, well, it looks kind of uh, complicated, but uh, it's, uh, it's defined basically recursively according to this formula. And um, okay, I think I'm going to skip over some details here. But basically via induction, you can, sh uh, you can get a nice bound over um, the size of these R alphas. And they are basically only going to depend on alpha through the size of alpha and number of vertices in alpha, okay? So to be clear, what do I mean by the number of vertices? Uh, oh, I realized maybe there's no chalk. Oh, there is chalk. <laughs> so here, alpha is taken as a subset of um, these uh, ij pairs, right? So if alpha is, say, the subset one, two, Q3, then there is actually a graphical interpretation for each alpha where you can look at the vertices in the graph and this subset alpha is going to correspond to a subgraph, one connecting to two, two connecting to three. So in this case, we have the size of alpha, the number of uh, edges it has is equal to two, but the number of vertices it includes is equal to three. Okay. 
And the nice thing is we can actually bound the size of uh, these R alpha quantities by something that only depends on the number of edges and number of vertices in the graph. And in the end, we do some combinatorial arguments. We collect all the terms to get the desired bound on the advantage, just finishing, uh, finishing the proof. And I want to mention some very nice properties about these R alpha things that we relied on heavily. So even though their recursive formula seems a little bit like it's, it's going to be a hell to analyze, but actually when you go into it, a lot of cancellations are going to happen and there are some very nice properties that ended up um, um, being crucial for us to um, uh, you know, control that bound. So for example, the R alpha actually very uh, nicely factorizes over all its connected components. So if alpha is not connected, then R alpha is going to be simply equal to a product of R beta over beta being all connected component of alpha. Okay, so this, is, uh, this helps significantly in the induction argument. Another very nice property is that if alpha is a tree, then we actually have R alpha is always going to be zero. So some crazy cancellations happen there and as a consequence of these two facts, if there is a graph alpha that contains one of the connected components, say it contains a single edge, then it's R, it's just going to be zero and we don't need to worry about it in the final band. And these two facts end up being very important. Otherwise, we're going to have too many terms in the combinatorial band and um, um, things cannot be controlled within little one order. And I wanted to point this out because it actually seems through our analysis that these two facts are not that specific to our uh, planted versus planted uh, like uh, um, uh, problem setup. I think these two facts, they may hold even more generally and we're sort of trying to understand exactly what independent structure about our model assumption is uh, uh, enabling us to use these two facts to hopefully get um, this to be more sort of a more general proof framework. Okay, um, and I want to, I guess, quickly mention that or we can also um, get similar results under the Gaussian model. So instead of Bernoulli's, you have plenty of Gaussians and we have the same message of, um, you know, the problem of testing uh, multiple versus multiple uh, planted communities is, uh, has, shares the same threshold as recovering all the members of the communities. Okay. Now I'm, I want to just uh, conclude with uh, a few discussion remarks. So I want to first note that this, um, um, this res uh, sorry, our, uh, our result actually sort of gives this alternative route as a byproduct um, to proving the computational harness for the recovering of community problem, right? So um, basically, uh, you first argue that the problem of recovering communities has to be at least as hard as um, the problem of uh, counting the number of communities. Therefore, in a regime where you cannot even consistently count, then there is no chance of uh, recovery. And that sort of leads us to think whether or not this uh, proof blueprint can lead to more general results or more, in more general like uh, harness uh, um, arguments against recovery problems, especially in problems where there is a presence of a detection and a, a recovery gap. So for example, in the planted dense subgraph problem, if you directly reduce to the null model with no planted community, then you're not going to get the sharp threshold because there is going to be a gap between detection and uh, uh, recovery. But if you reduce to uh, problem, you, 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 you reduce the recovery problem now to a planted versus planted problem, 
and uh, use a sort of this low degree framework to get harness of the planted versus planted problem if the problem is appropriately chosen to have the same harness threshold as the recovery problem, then this could potentially um, offer a general like proof method for attaining recovery harness. And uh, I guess we're also interested in, can we show harness of this planted versus planted the community problem other, uh, under frameworks that are not low degree polynomial, for example, can you um, get reductions from planted click? Can you show this under statistical query or uh, sum of squares frameworks? Um, yeah, in particular, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I would very much like to get like a reduction from this uh, planted click to the planted versus planted testing distribution because then that would give sort of a route that reduces from planted click to the recovery problem, which would be kind of cool. <laughs>